This morning in the collect, we prayed, O God, who makest us glad with the yearly expectation of our redemption, vouchsafe that as we joyfully receive thine only begotten Son for our Redeemer, so we may with sure confidence behold him when he shall come to be our judge, even Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Last week, I spoke a little bit about those other comings of Christ, unexpected and sometimes unlonged for, whether it be Christ offering you a share in his cross, or the Rex Tremende Majestatis, Christ the great King of glory on the clouds from the east at the end of the world. And it's true, isn't it? We don't generally long for these other comings of our Lord, not as we do for Christmas each year. But we ought to, when we survey the scene of this world, so sunk in public official sin against the good God we ought to yearn for Christ to come and judge the world by fire. Who would have thought, even a few years ago, that a man whom the world takes for Pope, who dresses in the white cassock, would take off his shoes and go into a mosque, and then at the direction of the imam, the minister of the mosque, point himself towards Mecca, as the Muslims do, and pray. Who would have thought that a man taken for Pope would tell a schismatic, a Greek Orthodox bishop, why you and I are both pastors in God's church and in the civil order in our own country, it begins. You may have followed some of that to do this past week, how a Republican congressman from Virginia, Virginia wants to make it a law that Congress members should take their oath of office only upon a Bible. It seems there is some new Democrat from Minnesota who's a convert to Islam, and he says he's going to use the Koran, their sacred book, which, of course, contains insults against our Lord and is from the devil. And that, I assure you, is only the beginning of things in our own country. But consider this, that the Protestant Bible contains many errors and false translations and thus its own share of implicit heresy. And finally, nobody at all this past week talked about that other rather unusual office-taking oath a number of years ago when Alan Greenspan, the Jew who headed the Federal Reserve Board for so many years, the Federal Reserve Board is a private bank which controls money in our country and thus throughout the whole world. It's an office the Jews often reserve for themselves. Well, when he took his oath of office, it was upon not the Old Testament, but upon the Talmud, the writings of the rabbis, which the Jews consider as their main uh, sacred book today. But that Talmud contains terrible blasphemies against our Lord and the Virgin Mary. No one's passing a law banning that. At the end of sacred scripture in the Apocalypse, our Lord says, I come quickly. And St. John writes, Come quickly, O Lord. And when we survey this world to which he must come, that surely is our sentiment. I want to tell you about a sermon this morning, about a sermon preached years ago in rural Ohio, about the second coming of Christ. It was preached by a minister called Peter Cartwright at a place and in a time which is far less sophisticated than our own. 
And in that era, before people considered worship to be chiefly entertainment, you know, the mega churches with their big TV screens and monitors and the band up front with all of its electronic instruments and uh, the rest of it. Well, this minister was trying to conduct an old-fashioned revival, and he had rented a tent, but nobody seemed to be coming forward for the altar call to get saved. And the last night came, and he was getting a little worried, and he preached about the last coming, the end of the world. He preached with all of his might and all of his mane, his words of that wordless terror that surely sinners will feel when they see Christ coming to judge them, and the world ends in flames. He stressed, the minister did, the sounding of the great trumpet, which would awaken the dead and call them out of their graves to judgment. And as his words mounted to a fevered pitch, suddenly there came the sound of a trumpet, Shrill and piercing, it blared out over the heads of the audience. And many thought, in their simplicity, that the world was actually coming to an end. And people got up and there was a panic and chairs were turned over and some headed for the exits and others screamed and fainted. And the minister was only able to restore calm in the tent when he called out, to a man who was sitting up in a tree whom he had hired to play the bugle during his sermon. It was a kind of a clumsy, dramatic prop, I suppose. Mozart or Verdi, the great composers of the Dies Irae, did it in a far finer way. But the day of his judgment is a terrible thing. And for it, each year, we set aside this little season, at least, to prepare. But whenever you come to a funeral in the Catholic Church or to a requiem mass and you hear the Dies Irae sung or the Libera Medomine, you follow the words and you hear the wonderful Gregorian melodies, that of itself is a reminder to you of the trumpet's last call, tuba mirens spargens sonum. And if you think of it, I mean your death, the end of the world, your sins recited before all of mankind, it is almost an unbearable thought. And yet, all you must do to receive him one day with confidence as judge is to receive him joyfully tomorrow when he comes as your Savior. No wonder the angels told the shepherds, fear not. We've been preparing to receive him joyfully not just three weeks, but I think most of our lifetime as Catholics, with a few detours maybe. And it is for that sake that we have offered up our little acts of penance and that we have received the sacrament of penance. We try to scrape together each day some time for prayer and recollection. And when we did see our Lord come with that hand-crafted cross fitted precisely to our own shoulders, if we didn't smile, at least we tried to receive it from him properly. And now we stand at the threshold of Christmas, and the gates of this paradise are about to be opened to us once again, the joy of seeing little children who for the first time in our midst will realize the wonder and the grace of our Lord's nativity. But we are still keenly conscious 
of our sins. They reproach us so. And we don't feel quite ready. We almost feel like a host whose invited guest arrives early. And you think to yourself, I'm not dressed yet, and I haven't set my table, and I'm still cooking the dinner. How under these circumstances may we ever receive him joyfully tomorrow? And if we find ourselves in that quandary, what on earth is to be said of those who don't give too much thought from one year to the next of our Lord? All of the visitors who come to church for Christmas I am thinking of. And so many are not ready to receive him as a redeemer, to succumb to the charms of his holy childhood, even though they want to see him. Of course they do. And they want to hear about him as well. There will be our Christmas and Easter Catholics. Some of them will show up. They always come faithfully. And there will be regular visitors who will be here absolutely for the first time tomorrow. And there will be family members and spouses who are coming because it's Christmas or because it's been made known to them that it would be in their best interest to show up at church tomorrow. And then finally, there is that group. I think of them as the St. Gertrude alumni, children who were raised in this church and have now grown up. And they often return for midnight mass with a significant other on their arms, a bit of liquor maybe on their breath, and who knows what on their souls. How are we going to take care of them and of ourselves in the last hours remaining? So much spiritual shopping and cleaning and gift wrapping is still to be done. Most of us haven't really started. Not really. Confessions, there will still be a few today. Tonight's holy vigil will win us all many graces, no doubt. What a wonderful thought. From about 8.30 till 3.30, there'll be somebody in this church praying. At St. Gertrude, it is still the holy night. And you can make it to be so whether or not you are here this evening. I think especially of our thinking of St. Joseph in these hours, to imitate him in his kindness and Our Lady in her wonderful patience. I think of a welcome that could be offered, a smile or some little assistance, a kind word to our visitors to make them feel at home. You don't have to judge them. Jesus will do that at the end. But it would be nice, joyfully, to receive them. A kind deed at home, perhaps, would come in handy these last hours. A compliment when you're just ready to criticize someone. And a smile when all you want to do is to frown. And don't forget, when all is done tonight, before the Christmas tree... Gather your family and pray a good, quiet rosary. There are many ways to prepare for his coming as our Redeemer, but the truth of the matter is we can't, not really. And that's the good news of the Holy Gospel. You know it is a sort of a New Age, a Gnostic, a heretical idea that man can redeem himself. We don't believe that as Catholics, not for a moment. We come to cast our sins at Christ's feet, and we beg him to pay the price of them, which we never, ever could manage to come up with. No, that's the reason we can look joyfully at the little Redeemer born this midnight, because he is our Redeemer. We can't do it for ourselves but he does. Receive him joyfully this Christmas. And I assure you, you needn't fear when he comes the next time. God bless you.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.